<laughs> I think I was a second year resident, but I'm not sure. Yes. There you go. There you go. Great. Sure. Um, first of all, I'm going to uncharacteristically say that I hope none of you came to Medicine Grand Rounds a couple months ago when I talked about colon cancer screening, because this is largely going to be uh, the same remarks that I made at that uh, at that talk. So if you missed that Grand Rounds, you didn't hurt my feelings, I'm glad, because that way you won't be bored today. If you fall asleep, I'll assume that, that you saw my Grand Rounds the first time. Um, the, um, the I'm going to be talking, this is going to be sort of an update on screening issues in, in colon cancer. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of extra information, some of which I put on a, on a, on a handout for today that, that gives a little more specific information relevant to the, to the elderly population. Uh, and then in addition to discussing uh, the uh, current status of screening tests for colon cancer, I, uh, I'm also the other main focus is going to be to talk about the new uh, and, and exciting uh, potential rivalry between optical or traditional colonoscopy and virtual colonoscopy, which is getting a huge amount of play in the, in the media, a lot of attention in the literature, and a lot of attention by the lay public. And I'll try and sort through some of that. And it's because of that part of that, that part of the focus of the talk, and because America loves uh, competition. And, talk about the potential competition between these types of screening modalities. I started out here with just some fun. Can we drop the lights in here a little bit? This is going to be pretty faint. Here we go. So I just figured we'd talk about some great rivalries. Allie and Frazier, somebody recognized. Even more fun, hopefully this, this rivalry won't be as disfigure, disfiguring as uh, Holyfield and uh, Tyson. Um, it'll be a little more serious than um, Billie Jean King and, and, uh, and Bobby Riggs, um, a little more erudite than the Stones versus the Beatles, my favorite old rivalry. It's also, it's also I think, the best drug-addled picture of Keith Richards that, that exists. Um, less violent than, than uh, Freddy versus Jason, less terrifying than Alien versus Predator, but still hopefully I think that, uh, that this uh, new potential rivalry is, is still of a, a, a great import given the amount of colon cancer that's out there, which we'll, which we'll be touching on. Okay, so, what is, and I hope you don't mind my sitting, it just, it's, I, I, can, I can actually see the screen better than if, than if, I, than if I stand, so. Uh, the, um, I'm sorry? Okay, great. So, this, we're talking about a very common, lethal, and preventable cancer. It's the number two cause of cancer death for both men and women and is the third most common cancer overall for both men. You, you want to scoot around? I hate to have you stand the whole time. There are, the chair, there are some chairs here. here. 148,300 new cases of colorectal cancer and almost 56,000 deaths. And for the uh, U.S. population at average risk, meaning those that don't fit into high-risk groups, the lifetime risk of colorectal cancer is 5 to 6%. As most of you may know, the vast majority of these cancers arise from uh, benign, initially benign adenomatous polyps. And there's a whole sequence of events that happens from the earliest uh, genetic mutations in individual colonic lining cells through the development of, of a small visible adenoma through progression to large adenomas and ultimately malignant polyps that invasive cancer. And the dwell time for this, the amount of the total time that it takes for this process for the first mutations to camp to an invasive cancer is about 10 years, which creates a window of opportunity for screening and removal of polyps and prevention. Now, about two thirds of all the polyps that we find in the colon are, are uh, adenomas, and the prevalence at age, at age um, uh, 50 is about 25% for, uh, for adenomas. By age 70, about 50% of of all patients will have at least one adenoma. And we find 90% of all colon cancers after the age of, of 50, which is why that's the age at which screening starts. Now, I've given you some additional information on, the, on this little brief handout here about the epidemiology 
I, I've, these larger numbers that I've given you here are for any polyp. If you look at the polyps that we worry about the most, and I'll be talking a lot about the significance of large versus small polyps here, uh, the prevalence of large greater than one centimeter polyps, which are the ones that are most likely to have bad histology and be closest to turning into cancer, at age 54, about 5% of people have these large polyps. By age 75, about 15%. And to give you, again, a little bit look at the progression of cancer incidence with age, you can see here on the handout that in between the age of 50 and 80, the, there's a 12-fold increase in the incidence of colon cancer such that by the age of, of 80, about 1 in 200 people per year will, uh, will develop colorectal cancer. Now, the value of finding and removing polyps is now unquestioned. This was pretty much <coughs> established 12 years ago by the National Polyp Study, published in 1993 in the New England Journal. In this study, 1,418 patients were followed for amina six years after the colonoscopic removal of one or more adenomas. And in this population, the incidence of colorectal cancer was decreased uh, 88 to 90 percent when compared to a couple of um, populations at similar risk for colon cancer in whom polyps were not removed and was removed 76 percent versus the general population which is a somewhat lower risk than those other comparative populations. Now it took a few more years for a, a, a consensus to emerge in the literature and then for payers to follow along uh, to, get behind the, to get behind the idea of screening. In 1997, the U.S. Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research convened a consortium of representatives from a whole bunch of different GI societies and cancer societies to establish distinct guidelines for colorectal cancer screening. These were first published in 97 and were just updated a couple of years ago. Uh, this, uh, coupled with separate recommendations from the American Cancer Society, uh, established a clear national consensus supporting colorectal cancer screening starting at age 50 in the average risk population, meaning everybody after the age of 50. And then in January of 1998, Medicare instituted uh, coverage for colorectal cancer screening and most insurers have now followed suit so that over the age of 50, most insurers will pay for average risk screening in the asymptomatic person over the age of 50. Not all have followed along. For example, in, if you are a Medicaid patient in Texas, you cannot get a screening colonoscopy funded through Medicaid. So of our current common screening tests that are in use, there are four main ones, the, the Squiat cards or fecal alcohol blood tests, flexible sigmoidoscopy, which is a short scope examination of about the lower third of the colon, double contrast, barium enema, and optical or conventional colonoscopy, which for the sake of this talk, <clears throat> I've mostly abbreviated as OC, not to imply that I'm a successive compulsive, I am, but it's, that's not what is here in this talk. So, fecal occult blood testing. This is recommended based on the consensus guidelines to be done yearly. Three stools, two samples each, with a colonoscopy performed for any positive result. Just one or three are positive, you get a colonoscopy. In three randomized controlled trials, this is one of the one of the interventions that has been best looked at with hard science. In three randomized controlled trials, <coughs> fecal occult blood testing achieved 16, 18, and 33 percent reductions in colorectal cancer mortality, and it can detect up to 92 percent of cancers. And it's probably the least invasive of all the tests that we do, but there are a lot of problems with fecal occult blood. Patients are still not very compliant with it. It's not very specific. It's poor for detecting precursor polyps, and it's great to find cancers, but if a lot of what you find is already invasive or advanced, then you're, 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 uh, you're out of luck. It still misses some cancers. Uh, there have been some attempts made to improve the accuracy of GWIAC, including rehydration of slides. This does increase the sensitivity, but at a loss of specificity. And dietary restrictions have been, uh, although they've been advocated, you know, avoiding red meat, orange juice, and all these sorts of things, they, they don't
don't really improve the specificity of the tests and they further decrease the compliance via be below the levels that it's that it's already at. Now what about flexible sigmoidoscopy? This is recommended by consensus guidelines every five years in the asymptomatic patient if that's the route that you choose to go. It requires minimal prep, just a couple of enemas right before the examination. No sedation is required, so there's a lot of logistical uh, attractiveness about FlexSig. And there have been four case control studies that showed a decrease in colorectal cancer mortality uh, by two-thirds for cancers occurring within the reach of the sigmoidoscope. There was not a decrease in colorectal cancer risk uh, beyond 60 centimeters, but, it, but there was a, a, a uh, Scandinavian study in 1999 that did show that FlexSig followed by colonoscopy, if polyps were found, could achieve up to an 80% reduction in colorectal cancer incidence. Now one of the big worries about FlexSig as a screening intervention is the, the problem of significant proximal lesions above the reach of the sigmoidoscope and the prevalence of advanced proximal neoplasia, meaning polyps with advanced histology and or large polyps uh, in patients who don't have distal adenomas is anywhere from 2 to 5 percent, meaning these are patients where if you do a flex sig, don't find any adenomas and you say, fine, we're going to stop now, in 2 to 5 percent of the patients you're going to be missing something significant, a cancer or, a, or an advanced polyp up above. And in, in, in several large prospective screening colonoscopy studies, they have found that 50% of patients who had advanced proximal lesions had no distal lesions. And in, a, in another study by uh, Doug Rex, whose name you'll see several times through here, he's done a lot of the work in colonoscopy, 65% of patients with known cancers proximal to the splenic flexure had no distal adenomas. So this is why, uh, there, are, although there's a proven benefit to flex sig, there are still uh, some concerns about the accuracy of completely clearing the colon as far as risk of, of malignant lesions. Okay, what about double contrast barium enema? This is now recommended every five years. The original consensus guidelines said 10 years, but because of some of the problems with barium enema, it's now been downgraded, if you will, to every five years if you're going to use that new screening intervention. Again, a barium enema, would be performed by radiology, of course, is uh, followed by a colonoscopy for any studies that suggest polyps. Now, unlike with uh, quiet cards and flex sig, there are no randomized trials to show any effective reduction in colorectal cancer incidence or mortality for barium enema. But it is still included as a screening option, number one, because it examines the entire colon. Uh, it is very available. It is cheaper than a colonoscopy, and it is safer than a colonoscopy. We'll talk more about potential colonoscopy complications. Well, I think, I mean, Like I said, it is it is it's it's cheaper and safer. But notice I did not say better tolerated. Okay, and and and, and that's and that's a very it's a very important point. I'm not going to. I mean, my first bullet here. There's a declining interest among radiologists. Barium is a dying art. Okay, it is an art, and it's a wonderful thing. And and a well done barium study of, of any part of the GI tract is, is 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 a fascinating thing. And it's really done with attention to detail and technique, it can be a, a fabulous study, but it's not sexy. It's not a PET scanner, it's not an MR, it's not all these fancy things that you can do to, you know, it, it, it's, it, so it's, so it's not, it, it, it's, it's not a growth industry, okay, <laughs> all right, and, and, and as, again, for older patients, it's, it's not, uh, it's not a, a benign thing. Most people would not find, first of all, they're not, they're not getting any sedation, and so, I mean, we're going to talk more about the discomfort of colonoscopy, but there's discomfort with barium enema too, and they're never sedated because they're in. They're, oftentimes, they're alone in a radiology suite with just a tech, and the physician is reading the studies later on, or maybe involved briefly during some of the spot films. But most of it is just the patient and the technician alone in the radiology suite. Okay, 
So there are also some major sensitivity issues with barium enema. Uh, to wit, a, pers a prospective study of double contrast barium enema found that less than half of all large adenomas were detected uh, in this study from a few years ago and from another study by Rex where he looked at a non-randomized series of almost 2,200 consecutive colon cancer cases from the community practice, double contrast barium enema had been done previously and missed 15% of these cancers. So there, are, so again, there are lots of potential limitations. Which brings us to, um, to uh, my uh, second favorite procedure, and you know, what's gonna get my kids through college, I guess, is um, optical colonoscopy. Now in current guidelines for the average risk patient undergoing screening with, with no symptoms. This is recommended every 10 years. Remember the dwell time I talked about of the, uh, of the time to develop cancer. And this is the current gold standard. It finds the vast majority of polyps in cancers and is the only test available that provides both detection and removal of polyps, including in situ cancers. If we take out a a large polyp that has a focus of non-invasive or superficial cancer in it, uh, then that patient's not going to need to be followed up any sooner than if we've taken out a large, completely benign polyp. Now, there's the science behind colonoscopy is not as rigorous as for some of the other interventions that are not the gold standard. There's no direct evidence that uh, Optical colonoscopy reduces colorectal cancer incidence or mortality in the asymptomatic average risk population. However, there are several lines of evidence that do support its efficacy. In the uh, fecal occult blood, like the GUIAC screening trials that did show redu reduced colorectal cancer mortality, the agent that produced that decrease in mortality was not just the detection of a heme positive stool, but the subsequent colonoscopy and removal of polyps. That was an integral part of those of those studies. It wasn't just finding the blood, it was getting the polyps out or the cancers out subsequently. We know that flexible sigmoidoscopy decreases colorectal cancer mortality in the examined colon. And it is common sense that optical colonoscopy, which looks at more of the colon and with a better prep, and therefore probably better mucosal visual visualization and less spasm, should, we would think that those benefits should extend to colonoscopy. And then finally, as I've already showed you, the National Polyp Study showed that optical colonoscopy decreased the incidence of, of colon cancer in cohort studies of patients with adenomas. This was not a screening population, but it was follow-up follow -up of patients who had adenomas removed. Now, the 10-year interval, as I've uh, as I've intimated to you, is based in part on the excellent sensitivity of colonoscopy. It's also based on the 10-year dwell time for progression to cancer. And it, that data is also supported by a cohort study of 154 asymptomatic average risk patients who had a less than 1% incidence of advanced neoplasms at a five-year follow-up colonoscopy after having initial negative colonoscopy. So they had a negative colonoscopy, five years later they get another colonoscopy, and less than 1% of them had any advanced lesions at that, at that point. So all these things coupled together to support the, the um, actuarial projection, if you will, that, you, that we can wait 10 years in the average risk population from one exam to the next. Now, there are lots of problems with colonoscopy. Of all these studies I've showed you, it's by far the most expensive, and the median cost of $1,800. That's, that's, uh, more of that is facility fee than professional costs, but those are the two that are combined there. And for a, a very invasive test, it has a relatively low yield. About 85% of screening examinations will not find any significant pathology. And it certainly has the highest major complication rate with about one in a thousand patients undergoing a major complication principally either perforation or post-polypectomy hemorrhage. And in the Medicare age population, the risk of perforation doubles, and the risk of perforations being fatal also doubles. So for the elderly, these complications, as, as are other surgical complications, are, are in particular a significant issue. Other problems relating to the convenience of the procedure. Patients, the vast majority of patients in this country undergo IV sedation for colonoscopy as opposed to other countries, with, uh, China for example, where almost nobody receives uh, sedation. Um, but the institution of sedation requires all kinds of extra paperwork and nursing time, 
recovery time. They have to have a chaperone to drive them home. They're going to miss work potentially for the prep, uh, but also uh, uh, the day of the procedure. They're going to lose an entire day, basically, in most cases, to have a colonoscopy done. The prep itself is quite uncomfortable uh, and may itself have complications. Um, the, the Fleet's phosphosoda preps can give you quite a load of phosphorus. And if you have kidney disease, liver disease, or heart disease, as many of the patients in your elderly population are going to have, then you may be looking at, at problems with electrolytes during, during a, a Fleet's phosphosoda prep, or you may be looking at dehydration problems because the Fleet's prep is an, uh, is an osmotic prep. And so the volume of the flush that's clearing out the colon comes at the expense of the patient's circulating blood volume. I mean, they're going to equilibrate, but I mean, it's an os it's osmotic prep that's drawing the fluid from the patient. Go lightly is safer from that, from that standpoint, from an electrolyte standpoint, but um, but it's because it's an isoosmotic solution, but they have to drink a gallon in a fairly short period of time. Did you have a go lightly prep? Okay. And I, I had, I had, I, I celebrated my 40th birthday by having, having to have a colonoscopy 10 years earlier than I expected. And I was miserable from the prep. And the procedure was a breeze. The prep was, the prep was, the go lightly prep was, was uncomfortable. And for an older, older person with, with the potential for various infirmities, that can be even, even more of a problem. So it's, again, it's not a benign thing. There's physical discomfort with the examination, largely blunted by medication, maybe not totally. And then there's the problem of incomplete or suboptimal examinations, which may happen because you have to stop if the patient's in pain. It doesn't happen very often. If they have inadequate prep results, again, not frequent, but happens, or if there's a lot of tortuosity or spasm in the colon that affects the uh, accuracy of the, of the mucosal visual visualization. And finally, there's the problem of missed lesions. Yes, colonoscopy is the gold standard, but it's not a perfect gold standard, and it does have a miss rate. Uh, Rex did the best study of this, a, uh, a tandem back-to-back -back colonoscopy study in 183 patients where two expert colonoscopists, they got patients to agree basically to have two immediate back-to-back -back colonoscopies. Doctor one goes from start to finish, doctor two turns around and does another procedure start to finish and sees what doctor number one missed. And in this, proceed, in, in this study, uh, if you look at all polyps, they missed 24%. Now, if you back that down and look at the miss rate for significant polyps, the greater than one centimeter polyps, or the ones that we worry about the most, it was only 6%. And most of the polyps that were, that were, that were missed, the majority were in this, what we believe to be fairly insignificant small range of five millimeters or less. There was an earlier tandem colonoscopy study in 90 patients that was much more uh, uh, generous to us endoscopists and found that the miss rate for polyps eight millimeters or greater was zero percent. So the truth is probably somewhere, somewhere in between there. And Rex has further shown that if you rush out because you want to get to the next colonoscopy or get to the, get to the, uh, uh, the tea time or whatever it is you're rushing to get to, uh, that if you if you don't take your time, aspirate. Uh, uh, pools of fluid and have careful circumferential visualization, then you're going to increase uh, your miss rate for significant lesions. Now what about cost efficacy? Uh, for all of these screening interventions, it's actually quite acceptable, whether you're talking about fecal occult blood, flex sig, barium enema, or optical colonoscopy, all of these are as cost effective or better than many other commonly accepted screening tests if you use the common standard of less than $25,000 per year of life saved. And in a uh, 2001 scoring that was done of uh, a variety of available preventive health services, colonoscopy or colon cancer screening in general, not colonoscopy, but colorectal cancer screening in general by whatever modality scored near the top of this ranking both in terms of cost efficacy and in terms of the burden of disease that was out there in the population to be prevented. And then finally in a Markov study a few years ago, Sonnenberg showed that optical colonoscopy was more cost effective than, than occult blood testing or flex sig despite consi considerably higher upfront costs as I've showed you and that was because it, did, it achieved a reduction in colon cancer mortality at relatively low incremental costs. And at that point, I'll pause for just a second when we're talking about 
screening rates and reimbursement, and, I'll, and I'm, I, I'm not going to read through this because I put it for you to look at, uh, but, I, but for the population that you're concerned with, I just wanted to show you what Medicare will, will cover, because Medicare is the coverage that the vast majority of, of your patients are going to have in, the, in their age range. And, I, and I've put in, wanted to make sure you appreciate the distinction between screening and surveillance. Screening is what you do in an average risk patient with no symptoms. If you're doing it for heme positive stool, belly pain, change in bowel habits, you're not screening. You're doing a diagnostic study to investigate symptoms. But if you are screening the asymptomatic patient for colon cancer, then Medicare will pay for a occult blood test yearly, a flex sig every four years, or a colonoscopy every 10 years, as long as it's at least four years since their last flex sig. And they will pay for a very minimum every four years, although there is a stipulation that to get your barium enema approved, the referring physician has to write a note explaining why barium enema is, is a preferred study for the patient in question and is expected to be just as good as, as colonoscopy. And since that's a very hard argument to make, the deck is really stacked against barium enema. Once you find a polyp and you're following up a polyp, you're not screening anymore. You're surveying a patient who's now been demonstrated to be at increased risk for polyps and by extension colorectal cancer. So once you're doing that sort of follow-up of prior polyps, Medicare will pay for a colonoscopy every two years or a very many, every two years. Once you find polyps, and this is an important point, once you've found polyps and you're following up the patient in that setting, then flex sig is no longer it is not in the equation anymore, nor is occult blood. So if you have a patient that you've referred for a screening colonoscopy and they find a polyp, and the recommendation is to do a repeat colonoscopy in three years or five years, you don't need to do annual quacks in that patient. There's no reason to do it. The overwhelming likelihood if you do a, a guaiac a year after a colonoscopy and maybe they found a polyp, maybe they didn't, the overwhelming likelihood is that a positive guaiac at that point is going to be a false positive. Okay, and so we, we sort of beg people not to muddy the waters by mixing screening strategies and surveillance strategies. Okay. All right. So what's the problem in screening right now? And, and this, um, I, this applies to the entire population, but I think it's particularly tr uh, true in the, in the geriatric population where there's a lot of uh, concern and resistance to the inconvenience, the physical invasion of these tests. And so the problem is, despite the fact that we know that these interventions are, are clinically efficacious, they're cost efficacious, they're paid for, uh, both by Medicare and third-party coverage, uh, there's been a lot of work done to improve national awareness in the lay public of the need for this, and that getting, make, getting colon cancer to be not such a dirty word. Uh, and despite the fact that here in the VA, for example, there have been huge waiting times for, for colonoscopy and in many other settings. Despite all these things, screening rates for colon, colorectal cancer remain quite low using the currently available tests. How low? Well, in a 1999 survey of the over 50 population, only 20% had had a fecal occult blood test done within the past year, and only a third had had either a flex sig or a colonoscopy within the past five years. And I've given you the map here from a rating or a rating system that was done of all the states. Uh, Dr. Uh, Garrity already alluded to the uh, uh, restrictions of Medicaid coverage, and this uh, ranking the states here based on how well the state legislation supported insurance coverage for colorectal cancer screening in those individual states. And, the, uh, and to get an A rating, you had to not only pay for all the accepted forms of coverage, but you had to have a proviso in the law that said if new forms of, of screening were proven to be efficacious, they would be automatically covered too. And so that was a pretty high bar, and that's why Texas got a, a B ranking. But as you can see, 37 states got an F, meaning they didn't stipulate any support for any coverage at all, and the insurers were not under any, any legal mandate to cover colorectal cancer screening. Now, this was as of uh, several years ago, so I suspect this is, has improved, but this gives you an idea of where our starting place was. Now, we've talked about some of the reasons why screening rates are low. Public awareness is still... Uh, somewhat low. The emergence of this consensus is uh, is still relatively new in terms of when it became a accepted in the, in the scientific literature that, that, that screening asymptomatic patients was good. Uh, 
the public has a lot of resistance to the idea of somebody looking inside their their colon and there are this professional attitude is not an issue so much anymore but if you go back 10 years the idea that you're going to sort of do knee-jerk health maintenance and make sure that every patient had had their their colorectal cancer screening done that's much more automatic now than it was even just five to ten five to ten years ago as I look at the referral patterns that come in I can see that primary care doctors are paying much more attention to this now than they were in the past and I'm sure that things like performance incentives and you know uh, in, uh, uh, you know, compensation that's based on how well all your patients are getting screened and you're doing all the recommended health maintenance stuff has some, has some uh, impact on that. And then finally in some settings there are uh, implementation uh, barriers to, to uh, getting the screening done. You may not have the um, public health infrastructure as in here at the VA. We had a one year waiting time a couple of years ago for an, an average risk screening colonoscopy. Completely unacceptable. We've, we've made major inroads in fixing that, but it takes money to fix it. And in, and in fact, some of those gains that we've made here in the VA are at risk right now because of budgetary problems in the Department of Veterans Affairs. And so you can, you know, that, that's an issue. And then manpower. Uh, you know, I'll talk a little more about do we have enough people to successfully perform the screening. And then finally, although I haven't put up a, a massive screening algorithm for you, if you start looking into all the follow-up stuff and all of the potential ways that a positive, uh, that a polyp can be followed up and then all the high-risk groups, these are not straightforward algorithms, okay? And so the complexity of guidelines for the, for the referring primary physician is, 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 once you get past the initial screening, it can get complicated sometimes. Okay, so let's talk about what your patients are probably going to be coming to you and, and asking for, asking about, and saying, can I get this instead? and that's virtual colonoscopy. Um, now in the GI literature we call this uh, CT colography. We don't like this idea of virtual colonoscopy with this total hands-off implication that it has. And as you'll see, it's not hands-off, but, but um, still an exciting, chain, uh, exciting uh, new uh, technique. This was first reported in 1994, and it is a computer simulated endoluminal inspection of the air distended colon. As I said, it's also known as CT colography or CTC. It can be performed by MR, but all of the major studies that have been done are done with uh, spiral CT scanners, and that's really the, uh, uh, the wave of the future, not MR. Uh, virtual colonoscopy has enormous conceptual appeal to patients and providers. It is, compared to uh, any endoscopic intervention, minimally invasive, does not require any sedation, takes certainly less time than colonoscopy and is really quite safe. So there's lots of things that make this very appealing. It does require a standard bowel prep. So that aspect, which is significant, remember I told you that the uh, bowel, bowel prep was the worst part for, for my colonoscopy. That's not any different here at this point in the technology. And there's also uh, manual rectal insufflation of air or carbon dioxide to quote unquote maximal tolerance. Mm -hmm. Uh, some patients, although in, in most studies not, some patients receive IV glucagon to relax the colon, although in most cases an IV does not have to be placed. Uh, image acquisition occurs during one to four 20 second breath holds, and then subsequently the interpretation of the study is done at a workstation by a radiologist. The radiation exposure is comparable to what is received during an abdominal our pelvic CT, and current charges in the United States range between $500 and $1,500. Now, interpretation of virtual colonoscopy depends on some very sophisticated post-image processing software and also an investment of radiologists' time. The computers generate an automated center line that allows for tracking of the lumen, and because it's all on a computer, they can inspect in both ways and look on both sides of a fold, something that a, uh, a colonoscope cannot easily do. They have 2D, two-dimensional image processing using what's called multi-planar imagery formatting, which can be done on an axial plane, on a sagittal plane, or a coronal plane. So they can turn the colon upside down, wrap it around, and inside out. And then because it is also a CAT scan of the abdomen, extra colonic findings may also be detected. So this just sort of shows you 
how the axle reconstruction is done and shows you the automated center line that is generated throughout the colon. Oh, I'm on the wrong way, sorry. And here's uh, some of the processing that's done. They do what's called shaded surface reconstruction to give you a, a shadowy view that, that is more uh, uh, in keeping with the endoscopic view that you would have. They can take the image and unfold it and take a, a curve in the a curve in the colon and, and reformat it and open up that curve so that rather than having a sharp flexure you've opened it up and you can look at it like a an unfolded mat. Uh, here you see a little polyp right here. They can color them so that it looks even closer to what to uh, what the normal human colon looks like. Again, ah, there we go. No? Yeah. Polyps. Now we may or may not get laser polyps in several locations there. And then here's a couple of slides showing you correlations between virtual colonoscopy and then the same polyps seen at optical colonoscopy. I won't even point to these, I think they're pretty obvious, but you can sort of see the, the, uh, the, the uh, correlation and the configuration. This you're not going to see. You're not going to see that. You're not going to see. Oh, in terms of, you mean? Well, it, it, that appeared to be a difference, so I just wanted to ask. If, uh, right. In in a in a in the optical in the in the. In terms of the vascularity of the colon overall, or well, the polyp or, itself. Or vascular pattern. Or, or polyp. Really, the thing that the thing that shows us polyps is is a bump. I mean, a, a is a is a a you know something growing out of the wall of the colon. Uh, the, va the color is, although, they, although some of them can look red or have different colors, that's, it's not the color change so much as the, the physical existence of a lump there and then textural changes. Because there are a lot of flat polyps that a, a skilled endoscopist will recognize because of a, a change in the, in the contour or, or the mucosa, whereas here it's, here it's smooth, all of a sudden you see an area that looks kind of like sandpaper or something. And if you look at them very carefully or spray them with a vital dye, you can realize that there's a mucosal change there. It's just not growing up into a polyp. So not all neoplasia is, is going to turn into a polyp. Most of it does, but not all. Okay. Again, some more examples. This polyp right here you're seeing is entrapped in a snare right now for removal. And here's an example here with bidirectional inspection. They picked up, uh, this isn't working, but they, you can see they picked up this little polyp behind that fold there on the left, which when they know what they're looking for, they can find it, but that could easily hide behind the fold during a colonoscopic inspection. Now there are some advanced techniques, some refinements that are not yet in widespread use. These include three-dimensional volume rendered reconstructions that allow simulated navigation through the lumen, or the so-called flyby. And there's also techniques being developed for electronic <laughs> cleansing of the colon, both uh, using barium to tag stool and fluid and using gastrographin to tag fluid so that you can digitally extract them from the image. Those are being worked on, they're not in widespread use yet. And then finally there's computer-aided diagnosis to decrease the amount of time that the radiologist has to spend at the workstation so you have sort of pre-recognition of most of the lesions by the computer. And here's just, let's, hopefully let's, let's get a quick prayer here, hopefully this will work. And yeah, there we go. So this kind of shows that there's the automated center line, and you can sort of see how the computer is tracking along that center line for interpretation. Also gives you a little feel for what the flyby is like. And then here's a little more dramatic example. Hopefully this will work. Hope none of you are prone to nausea. There's a little polyp here at, at 6 o'clock along the way here. Watch for it. Bingo. Okay, so if that reminds you of Luke in the trench on the Death Star, that, yeah, you're not alone. Okay, so the big question, and this is really sexy, and it's, uh, and, it's in, and it's interesting stuff, but does it work? Or more specifically, can virtual colonoscopy accurately detect polyps in, in a degree comparable to other, <coughs> other screening interventions? Well, to talk about this, we first have to address the issue of polyp size. Okay, this is a, a problem that doesn't matter per se 
in, in when you're doing optical colonoscopy, but it becomes very important here. It doesn't matter in optical colonoscopy because when we when we're in there doing a colonoscopy, we take out everything we see. All right, all polyps are removed. Rather, with, with virtual colonoscopy, you can look, but you can't touch. And so the question is, uh, sort of like from the movie Godzilla, does size matter, particularly polyp size? Okay. Uh, number one, how good is it at detecting polyps of different size? And number two, what polyps should be reported? What's your threshold for referring for colonoscopy? Well, information is somewhat limited about the natural history of small polyps. We know that the incidence of cancer or high-grade dysplasia in polyps less than five millimeters in size is way below one percent. So there's pretty good agreement that it's okay to ignore these small polyps. And there's also widespread agreement, as I told you, about what we consider high risk or advanced polyps greater than one centimeter in size, that all of them should be should come out. Because there is, although the data is limited, there is at least one study that shows that at least one percent per year of these large polyps will progress to invasive cancer. But the problem is that in the screened population, only about one to two percent have polyps greater than a centimeter in size. Uh, and of the other polyps, uh, of the other patients who have polyps, the other 30 percent or so have smaller polyps. Okay, so they're not all the obvious ones that we would agree need to come out. And so these medium-sized polyps in particular pose a little bit of a dilemma. For polyps five to nine millimeters in size, we don't clearly know what their cancer risk is. There's limited data available that shows that of polyps in this medium size range that a little under 1% will have invasive cancer in them and, and anywhere from 2 to 7% uh, may have bad histology, may not be a simple tubular adenoma, but may have villus histology or, and with high grade dysplasia. And for these polyps, there's no data on how rapidly the small polyps, the medium sized polyps, 5 to 9 millimeters in size, will progress to an invasive and curable cancer. So when we talk about virtual colonoscopy, we have to, again, we have to look at how accurate it is in detecting polyps of different size. When it does detect polyps, what size threshold, what, po what polyp size should be the threshold for triggering referral for optical colonoscopy? And the answers to these questions have distinct implications for how often you screen the patients, for how well patients accept them, okay, because you're gonna be telling people, well, we found X, Y, and Z, but we're gonna leave it alone, we're gonna leave it inside. Uh, and also it has implications for cost efficacy because the rate at which you set the frequency of the procedure and the rate at which you refer for a, a second inexpensive uh, optical colonoscopy is going to change the overall cost efficacy for virtual colonoscopy. Now early reports uh, were overall fairly uh, favorable. Uh, in most cases, not all, pretty good sensitivity and specificity. These were uh, fairly small numbers of patients, and they were clearly not screening populations. Many of these were patients who already had known cancers or large polyps. As you see from the incidence of polyps greater than one centimeter of size, in the case of the Fletcher study, 67% of their patients had large polyps. So this is a very skewed population of patients. But the early, the early data uh, was at least promising about, about uh, uh, accuracy. Now what I'm going to do is talk you through the few large randomized trials that have been published <clears throat> that give us the best picture for the accuracy of virtual colonoscopy as a, as a, as a screening examination. The first was uh, the Johnson study published in August 2003, and as you're going to see, this is all, this is all relatively late-breaking news. This is all within the last couple of years. This was a prospective blinded study at the Mayo Clinic, 703 asymptomatic patients over the age of 50 who were already scheduled for a colonoscopy for a variety of reasons. They were, this was not a screening population. Uh, they had either prior polyps, had a family history of cancer, or had iron deficiency anemia in a few cases. And the study of the design was a virtual colonoscopy followed the same day by an optical colonoscopy. As their gold standard, they used optical colonoscopy meaning that the endoscopists were blinded to the results of the virtual colonoscopy and the findings on the optical colonoscopy were taken as, as the gospel. The virtual colonoscopy was interpreted by two of three experienced radiologists 
the incidence in this population of adenomas greater than one centimeter in size was about 8%, still more than the background population, but still but a lot closer than the early studies. And um, 94 patients, or 13%, had medium-sized adenomas. And here's how it performed. As you can see, for polyps greater than one centimeter in size, uh, the three readers range from 32 to 73 percent in their sensitivity for large polyps with a mean of 46 percent and if you combined any two readers the best sensitivity for these large polyps which are the most easily detected was 63 percent and for the medium-sized polyps the uh, data was incrementally poorer. The specificity was, was uh, excellent. <clears throat> Miss rates for polyps were not affected by the location of the polyps, but they were affected by the polyp morphology, which comes back a little bit to the, to the point that, that you were making, Mike. Um, if, it doesn't make a, if it doesn't change the contour of the colon, virtual colonoscopy is not going to find it, whereas optical colonoscopy can if you're looking carefully. Now that said, the incidence of flat polyps is much less in the U.S. and in Western populations than it is in Japan, where the incidence of flat adenomas is much higher and it's a much greater clinical problem. But the um, relative risk with virtual colonoscopy of missing a sessile polyp um, was, um, uh, uh, well, actually compared compared to um, compared to pedunculated polyps, there was about a two times higher risk of missing both flat and, and sessile polyps because they just didn't make as big of a, of a change in the lumen. And the areas where they were missing polyps they, they, de they determined were areas where there was collapse of the lumen or there was uh, infiltration of the colon wall that produced thick folds that were of normal contour. This, so as, as, I've, as I've shown, their specificity was excellent. Sensitivity was well below sensitivity of optical colonoscopy and below uh, and it was lower than prior studies that had used these uh, cohorts of patients with a higher lesion prevalence. And they attributed this poor, this very disappointing accuracy to reader fatigue and, and overload of data. Their readers had to look at a, min at a minimum of 1,200 images for each study that they interpreted. And to find a single polyp greater than or equal to one centimeter in size, they had to look at over 13,000 images. And so, you, as I can tell you from looking at uh, uh, the 50,000 images that can be generated by a capsule endoscopy, it can be mind-numbing to, uh, to look through a whole host of computer images. Now, the next study completely turned this uh, debate in the literature on its head. The first study I showed you was, uh, was, was a gastroenterologist-led study uh, with collaboration of radiologists. This was a state-of-the-art radiology study, sort of you know, if you want to find out the best that virtual colonoscopy can do, you go to the people who are doing the best virtual colonoscopies in the country. And that's what this Pickard study, which got a lot of press in the uh, lay literature in December of 2003, showed. This was a prospective blinded study in three centimeters, three centers, 1,233 asymptomatic patients, mean age of 58. 97% of these patients were deemed to be average risk, so this really was a pretty much a, screen, a true screening population. Same day virtual and then optical colonoscopy. And this study introduced the concept of segmental unblinding to sort of level the playing field between the comparison between optical and virtual colonoscopy. In this study, the endoscopist was initially blinded, initially, to the results of the virtual colonoscopy for each colon segment, but then as they withdrew, so you pulled out of the out of the ascending colon. They then unblinded the endoscopist to the results of the virtual colonoscopy, and they went back and reinspected that area, armed with the knowledge of the virtual colonoscopy. So that was the segmental unblinding, and it was this segmental. It was the subsequent unblinded reinspection after virtual colonoscopy that was then used as the reference standard. And their protocol was that all of their examinations were the, the, the state-of-the-art techniques that are not yet widespread of, available. Three-dimensional flyby reconstruction on every patient using the uh, latest software by Viatronics. They used two-dimensional images only for secondary correlation. They did barium uh, tagging for solid stool and gastrographin uh, tagging of luminal fluid for electronic cleansing. Their 
their uh, virtual colonoscopies lasted 14 uh, minutes plus 19 minutes for interpretation. By comparison, uh, the time was about triple for optical colonoscopy, half an hour to do the procedure, another hour for recovery. And their overall presence of, of uh, adenomas was pretty close to the screening population. 3.9% prevalence of polyps greater than or equal to one centimeter, 13.6% for polyps greater than six millimeters. And here's what they found, much different findings. For virtual colonoscopy, uh, Best sensitivities of 94% for the largest polyps, 94% for medium-sized polyps, and almost 89% for the smaller polyps. And specificity was was excellent until you got down to the uh, to the smaller polyps. Whereas for optical colonoscopy, only 87.5% sensitivity on the large polyps, 91.5% on the medium-sized, both inferior to their virtual colonoscopy. And it was only on the small polyps that, opti that optical colonoscopy finally uh, was more sensitive than virtual colonoscopy. There were two malignant polyps. Virtual colonoscopy found both, but the initial blinded optical colonoscopy missed one of the two malignant polyps. And the negative predictive value of virtual colonoscopy was greater than 99% for polyps greater than or equal to 8 millimeters. Now, they pointed out in this study that the threshold for selecting clinically significant polyps, as I've already kind of intimated to you, was a critical factor. If they chose a cutoff size of six millimeters for referral, then almost 30% of their patients would then subsequently need an optical colonoscopy. If they chose eight millimeters, that cut it down to 13.5%. And if they only went with a centimeter or larger, found at virtual colonoscopy, then only 7.5% of patients needed to have an optical colonoscopy. And in their summary, they put forth the opinion that these findings support the concept of a colon screening center that offers virtual colonoscopy to patients with the opportunity for same day or next day therapeutic optical colonoscopy if needed. Very provocative proposal to shift the paradigm of colon cancer screening. Well, the pendulum swung back, if you will, a few months later. And in JAMA, this gastroenterologist-led study came out, another prospective blinded trial, nine major hospital centers, and their aim was to assess how virtual colonoscopy function in a community setting. They had 600 patients, a mean age of 61, again, same-day procedures, not a screening population. There were a variety of different indications for diagnostic studies, and the prevalence of adenomas was, it was uh, again, a little higher than, than average risk, but uh, not bad. 7% for the large lesions, 17.3% for the lesions greater than six millimeters. They used the same technique as the Pickard study of segmental unblinding. Now, in their primary analysis, their sensitivity and specificity for virtual colonoscopy was based on using two-dimensional images supplemented with selective 3D reconstructions to solve difficult problems in the interpretation. They later performed a secondary analysis where they examined a full 3D fly-through that was later read by the same radiologist without referring back to the initial two-dimensional studies. And here's what they found. For virtual colonoscopy, sensitivity for large polyps was only 55% and only increased 59% of the full 3D fly-through. For the greater than 6 millimeter lesions, the smaller ones, it was only 39% sensitive and only improved to 45%. Specificity, as in most of these studies, was excellent. Whereas optical colonoscopy had a 100% sensitivity for large polyps and a 99% sensitivity for greater than 6 millimeter polyps. Positive predictive value of virtual colonoscopy was only 50% in this study for polyps greater than one centimeter, and only 46% for polyps greater than six millimeters. There were eight cancers in these patients, two of which were missed by virtual colonoscopy. And sequential analysis of their, of their cases showed that over time there was no incremental increase with the learning curve, if you will, in virtual colonoscopy accuracy as the study progressed. In their summary, Cotton and colleagues noted that the performance of virtual colonoscopy in this study was dramatically inferior to what Picker had reported. 
They felt that the addition of the 3D flyby did increase sensitivity, but not nearly to the levels that Pickard and his colleagues had reported. And they felt that their findings were likely more likely to be reflective of how virtual colonoscopy would actually perform in the trenches in a community setting. Now, the last prospective trial has only appeared in abstract form. 614 patients enrolled at 14 sites. They were budgeted for 2,400 patients, but the safety board stopped the study when results very similar to the cotton study came out with dramatically inferior uh, sensitivity for both large and medium-sized polyps uh, compared to optical colonoscopy. Now, uh, Pickert wasn't going to take this lying down. And in, uh, I said September 2005, that's actually September 2004, we're not to 2005 yet. In, uh, so last September, they managed to get published an article in, in uh, Annals that was very provocatively entitled, Location of Adenomas Missed by Optical Colonoscopy. And their background statement was that previous estimates of the adenoma miss rate for optical colonoscopy are hindered by the use of optical colonoscopy as its own reference standard. Fair enough statement. So their objective was to evaluate colorectal neoplasms missed at optical colonoscopy by using virtual colonoscopy as a separate reference standard. Kind of cheeky if you ask me, but that's okay. So they took the exact same patients that they had used in their, in their New England Journal study a year previously and reanalyzed their data on these same 1,233 patients. There had been 1,310 polyps found at optical colonoscopy. There, of these, there were 21 adenomas greater than 6 millimeters that were missed at the initial blinded colonoscopy. Six of these were in the rectum, an area that we endoscopists think is easy to inspect and five of them were located less than 10 centimeters from the anal verge. 15 of the 21 were non-rectal, all, almost all of which were on, located on a fold, and 10 of the 15 were located on the back side of a fold, or on the proximal end or the anagrade end of the fold, the side that's harder to look at with the colonoscope. And so they emphasized with this data the anatomic pitfalls or relative blind spots of optical colonoscopy. And they also looked at per polyp miss rates. If you looked at virtual colonoscopy, using optical colonoscopy as your reference standard, the virtual colonoscopy had a lower miss rate than optical colonoscopy for the largest polyps and for medium-sized polyps. And the uh, miss rate of optical colonoscopy was only superior to virtual colonoscopy for the, for the, uh, for the very small polyps. Now, while this has been going on in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the scientific literature, there's also been a debate going on in, uh, in the media. And all this stuff, as soon as Pickard's study came out, immediately the radiologists applied for a Category 1 CPT code for virtual colonoscopy, uh, as opposed to its, its current Category 3 or experimental CPT code. And this was vigorously opposed by the, all, the, all the main GI societies, as you can see in this uh, study, they all went to Washington and said, no, 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 or went to the AMA and said, no, 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 a virtual colonoscopy doesn't warrant its own CPT code. But this doesn't hold down industry, which of course is happy to market uh, anything where it thinks uh, that uh, the public uh, can um, make a buck. And as you can see here, this came out. I got this off of the internet. You can click on body scan, and if you want to get yourself scanned for your own greater health so you can find out everything that's wrong with you, you can click on a state and find the nearest body, body scanning center near you. And the software people want you to protect the ones that you love. And you can be healthy like these people if you get a virtual colonoscopy, which as you can see is quick, easy, has no sedation, and is more comfortable. They don't say what it's more comfortable than, but it's more, it's more comfortable, okay? And, um, you know, so they, they this, this is, these are both from the Viatronics Corporation, which markets the software that's used for uh, virtual colonoscopy. And, you know, emphasize here. Now there's no reason not to be screened. So your patients are seeing this and they are responding to it. Okay. I know I'm, I know I'm, I'll, I'll try and wrap up quickly here. Okay. Okay. So it's out there in the marketplace. Radiologists are, are pushing it. Uh, CT and software companies are pushing it. The public, I think, is certainly hungry for other options. And it's been estimated that by next, well, by two years from now, there may be 4,000 neighborhood 
scanning centers that will offer non-reimbursed full body scans, including virtual colonoscopy, in like strip malls and other malls and you know health boutiques and this stuff, not in traditional healthcare settings. <clears throat> now the GI community uh, is not to, still not taking this lying down, and here you see a big ad that was placed by the American College of Gastroenterology about how complete colonoscopy, which is the loaded language they use to describe optical colonoscopy, how complete colonoscopy will save your life, and they emphasize that it's the gold standard still. Uh, and here you see when uh, the AGA put out its, uh, the American Gastroenterology Association published its state-of-the-art thing on virtual colonoscopy, saying that it wasn't yet ready for prime time. They made sure that they got placement, and they, they let us members know that they'd gotten this into the Washington Post, USA Today, et cetera, et cetera, major media outlets. So they're out there pushing in the press for us. Well, what about patients? What do they want? Rex has pointed out that a new test does not have to outperform current strategies in all categories. A particular advantage, such as acceptability to patients, could be enough to push a test to acceptance. And patient preference for virtual colonoscopy is clear. In six out of seven studies that have looked at this, there's been a clear preference for virtual colonoscopy. Discomfort is similar. PrEP is the same, and most patients agree that the PrEP is the worst part, but they still select virtual colonoscopy as their preferred test for follow-up uh, because it's faster, it's less, they feel it to be less physically challenging, and there's no sedation required. And this is why your patients are going to be coming to you and asking about this. Um, I'm going to slip past cost efficacy and simply say that it's probably at this stage less cost efficacious than optical colonoscopy. And it's been estimated in one study that 15 to 20 percent more patients would have to be compliant with screening than currently are. And the, and the procedure rates would have to be 54 percent less than colonoscopy for virtual colonoscopy to be cost effective. That's the projection. In terms of manpower, um, again, I'm going to go quickly because I'm out of time, but basically uh, a, a complex survey and manpower projection has suggested that the manpower is out there to screen the existing population with colonoscopy. However, if only half of our excess capacity was devoted to screening colonoscopy, it would still take 10 years to get caught up on screening the, currently, uh, the current population that needs to be screened. So it depends on how much of your excess capacity you devote to screening as to how long it'll take you to catch up. So the resources are there, but it's not a slam dunk to get everybody screened with colonoscopy. Uh, in terms of radiology, uh, the software is not yet widely distributed. Uh, there's a manpower shortage in radiology, but it's growing and, and on, a, on, a, on, a, on a business side, the 3D imaging market is booming and these centers are popping up all over. There may be 11,000 3D imaging uh, sites uh, by 2006. So I'm going to summarize by saying that virtual colonoscopy is a promising test for colorectal cancer screening. It has some many potential advantages over what I do. Safety, patient acceptance, lack of sedation requirement, and immediate return to work. Uh, however, with three out of four large studies showing that the accuracy is significantly inferior to optical colonoscopy, I feel, and most authorities in, in, in GI, feel that it's too early to endorse the general use of virtual colonoscopy as a first-line screening test or a surveillance test for colorectal neoplasia. And the current indication should be an incomplete colonoscopy. A patient with an obstructing colon cancer, where you can't inspect the colon, and you're planning surgery or a palliative stent. Patients who, because of um, comorbidities, are poor candidates for optical colonoscopy and conscious sedation. And, and we may see many of these, patients who refuse optical colonoscopy. Some of the questions that need to be answered. Can the results of Picker be generalized to community practice, the accuracy that he has shown? Uh, what is the accuracy of virtual colonoscopy for small and medium polyps? How important is it to find these polyps? What threshold of polyp size should trigger a referral for polypectomy? Must we even acknowledge or report polyps beneath a certain size? If polyps are left inside, how soon should you repeat another screening virtual colonoscopy? 
What are the implications of the follow-up regimen that you, the follow-up interval that you pick on cost efficacy and radiation exposure? How tolerant will we as physicians and patients be knowing that there are lesions with a cancer potential somewhere down the line being left in situ? And what are the implications in terms of morbidity and mortality and cost of evaluating incidentally discovered extra colonic findings? There can, there, there, there can be some marginal improvements in colonoscopy, uh, better adherence to competence indicators, better preps, better sedation, fancier scopes. These things will have incremental improvements, but colonoscopy is a pretty mature technology. Big improvements are going to come in virtual colonoscopy uh, that I've already pretty much described to you. The, um, uh, the gold standard would be a prepless virtual colonoscopy where you no barrier, no gastrographin, where everything could be digitally taken out so you just walk in, get your scan, and uh, that remains to be seen if that can be achieved. Uh, this is not about whether my kids go to college or Dr. Dodd in radiology, whether his kids go to college. I think there's plenty of colon cancer screening to be done. Uh, there's plenty of polyps to be found and removed, and I think everybody's kids are going to get to go to college. And the ultimate result is for our patients to grow old, free of colon cancer, and uh, have a screening that is acceptable to them. And I apologize for going over, and I thank you very much for your attention. Questions that I that I can answer. Yeah. I have a patient uh, who had a colonoscopy uh, four years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, had some adenomatous polyp, non-malignant. Uh, now has stool-like positive. Uh, I would I would definitely read colonoscope that patient. I mean, the w one thing I didn't put up here for you. I, di I didn't I didn't go into follow up. Uh, details about follow-up intervals. Because we usually recommend those at the time of things that we find. But basically, if we find a single polyp <clears throat> that's less than a centimeter in size, and it is a simple tubular adenoma, the follow-up for those patients is five years. Okay. If we find multiple polyps, if we find even a single large polyp, a centimeter or greater, or we find any polyp of any size that has higher grade histology, okay, and by that I mean Remember, within adenomas, all adenomas are neoplastic, all adenomas have cancer potential. But the majority of adenomas are what we call tubular adenomas, that's the histology, the tubular glands. Those have the least cancer risk. Intermediate mixed histology is tubulovillus, and then the, the highest risk are, are villus adenomas, which are predominantly villus. If it's tubulovillus or villus, those patients get three-year follow-up. Okay? So if you're already at four years, the patient had at least a single adenoma, and they're heme positive, then I would do a repeat examination there. And, and, and Medicare, by the way, again, it's on your sheet, but again, if you had a, if you had a polyp, Medicare will fund a repeat uh, surveillance colonoscopy to follow up an initial polyp within two years. And so from a fundability standpoint, you're within that, you're within that margin. Has there been any talk about doing a multidisciplinary approach to this problem, like having radiologists gastroenterologists working together at the same time oh, with I've, the same equipment. I mean, it just seems that would be the most I've, practical I've, approach. I've, I've, I've played this up, you know, as a competition just for fun, because let me pull down sexy slides. But, um, yeah, I mean, in, in all of these studies, radiologists and gastroenterologists and individual centers and the multi-center studies, are, they're, I mean, they're, they're working together on, on performing these studies and in trying to figure out the, the best way to screen. I mean, I'm I've played it up for, for, for competition, although there is, you know, at the level of, of politically of our societies, there is some turf going on, which is probably, on both sides, is probably not completely appropriate. But, and again, I was, I was running out of time. The logistics, I didn't, I, I didn't emphasize this in one slide, I had to go over kind of quick. The logistics of trying to, I mean, the best cooperation, okay, assuming that, assuming that we can reproduce pickers, number one, generalize that technology and get that and get those results in the community practice. Okay. The community practice of colonoscopy is really quite good. We don't know yet if the community practice of virtual colonoscopy, I mean now at this point it's clearly not up to the level of what Pickard's doing. In the future can it be? I think probably eventually it will be. It's just, it, 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 I don't, who knows when it's going to get there. We have to show that we can get to that level of accuracy in community practice. At that point the, the gold standard cooperation or the nirvana of cooperation would be to have the ability to do 
virtual colonoscopy as your initial, more acceptable screen for patients, okay? And then have the patients referred over for same day colonoscopy. So it's all one day, one prep, everything, okay? It, with our current practice model, the logistics are impossible, okay? I mean, our endoscopy lab and the endoscopy lab here scopes day in and day out. I, well, I mean, not, I mean, you know, our fellows knock off for rounding and other unimportant things like that. But I mean, you know, we scope constantly. We are, we are booked two to six months in advance. And so the idea of having sort of a gastroenterologist and a GI suite sort of on call for, uh, for, for polypectomy patients off the cuff, it, the logistics of that are very difficult. It's kind of like when the radiologist asks me to be on call for ERCP during their lap colates. I mean, we've got two separate operational centers and operate whether it's a radiology suite and an endoscopy suite and or an, or an OR and an endoscopy suite that are booked way in advance without a lot of flexibility I think it's I think it's I think it's doable and if we got to where there was a, a large volume of virtual colonoscopy being done to where you could anticipate okay we're doing we're doing you know uh, 20 virtual colonoscopies today and we can predict that, uh, depending on your threshold that you choose, that 15% uh, uh, of those patients or 10% are going to need colonoscopy. Well, we can reserve a couple of slots for those patients in the schedule. I mean, I think I think there, there's there's room there for, for for collaboration, but it's 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 not going to be it's not going to be easy. I just almost think that gastroenterologists. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, if you go back to the slides where I was showing the bumps, I mean, a, a, <clears throat> a visible bump is a visible bump, and in fact, I think I think Pickard has shown that they can find things that we miss. There's no doubt from our, from from the GI from our own GI studies that we miss some polyps. Okay, and Rex showed that for sure. And I think Pickard showed where and why we're missing those polyps. Okay, uh, that one polyp I showed you with the biopsy forceps heading towards it was totally missed and then when the virtual colonoscopy said go back to I mean there's a polyp on the flip side of that fold and they go back and they look and they tease and you take your forceps and push on the polyp and try to fold it over it can be it can be very very difficult now a good endoscopist you know our, we, we try to do a very careful circumferential inspection but some of that stuff we're going to miss most of what we miss is small but not not all of it and so you know I think I think if you're talking about bumps and you have a, a well done virtual colonoscopy, they're gonna, they can find the bumps. And it may get better if the computers can find the bumps for the radiologist, and rather than 1,200 images, it's just 150 that they have to look at that have, where the computer thinks there may be a bump. Now, if I were in Japan, I'd be much more worried about this, because in Japan, there's a much higher prevalence of flat neoplasia. Don't know why, but, it's, but they, have, they have flat gastric cancers, and they have a lot more, lot more flat polyps. And uh, so, and there you'd be much more leery of virtual colonoscopy. It's not going to find those. Yeah. Anybody over 50 who has uh, no family history of, I'm not increased risk of colon cancer, just animals look like, is it um, enough to follow through? It is, it, is an, it is an accepted screening intervention to do by, um, uh, you know, by consensus guidelines, if you and your patient decide that, um, that they want to go that route, it is an accepted intervention with proven reduction in colorectal cancer mortality, but it's got to be three cards, three separate stools, two smears from each stool on the three cards, and brought in and, 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 and treated with the, uh, with the indicator. Um, so if you, if you can achieve that, if you can get them to return three cards and do it annually, you will achieve a reduction in, 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 in follow-up positive results in colon cancer, in, in, in follow-up positive results with colonoscopy. You know, that is a proven uh, beneficial intervention, okay? Is it the current gold standard of screening? I'll tell you that most people feel that the current gold standard screening intervention is, is a colonoscopy every 10 years, okay? Now, we're a little biased, and there's probably more gastroenterologists than, than radiologists involved in the writing of these consensus guidelines, but that's 
you know, that, that sort of idea of total inspection of the colon at least once uh, every 10 years to, to find any polyps is, is probably the, by far the most common intervention right now. Okay, so it's, it's accepted, but it's probably not the most common practice or the national standard. If, if, you know, my, my personal bias, and I have, I have some bias, I, mean, I, try, I try to be balanced about these things, you know, my, my personal bias is that I would tell patients that most people get a colonoscopy in America in 2005 for colon cancer screening. However, these are your other options, and these are the pros and cons of the options. Okay. So, thank you very much.